two writers, both masters of their craft. Very different on the surface, their work has far more in common than many might assume. Neither were taken very seriously as literary artists, but they nevertheless shaped the popular understanding of both the novel and the short story in the 20th century. They dominated the interwar period, and are still intensely associated with it, despite having careers that spanned decades. Millions devoured their stories, and the influence of their characters and ideas is still very present in works being published today. Both had to grapple with what it means to be a national treasure, and the high level of scrutiny such immense popularity brings. Today we are going to explore the relationship between Agatha Christie and P.G. Woodhouse, or Agatha and Plum, to their friends. Welcome to She Done It. I'm Caroline Crampton. When it comes to Agatha Christie, I think I can presume a certain amount of knowledge among my listeners. But for P.G. Woodhouse, a more detailed introduction is required, not least because even those who think they know about him and his work may have only come across one or two of his more well-known creations. Pelham Grenville Woodhouse, or Plum as he was known, is a writer I've been reading since my early teens, but I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of his extensive and varied literary output. Luckily, though, I've got help on that front. I am Eliza Easton. I have founded a think tank called Erskine Analysis, which works on creative industries and soft power and the future of the UK economy. But as a kind of odd hobby, I spend a lot of my time reading, writing and talking about 1920s literature and especially P.G. Woodhouse, but more recently, a bit about Agatha Christie and Marjorie Allian and others from the kind of golden age. Eliza has probably come the nearest to truly completing the Woodhouse canon of anyone I've ever met. And I can't think of anyone better to introduce us to him and his work. P.G. Woodhouse is an extremely prolific British-born comic novelist, born in the tail end of the 19th century, so nine years before Agatha Christie, around the same time as lots of the authors you talk about on this podcast. He's probably best known, if they've heard of him, they might have heard of Bertie Wooster and his valet Jeeves. There's been several very famous adaptations on TV and actually on film of the Jeeves and Wooster stories. But Woodhouse also wrote about lots of different worlds. So one of my favourite worlds he wrote about was Blandings with its extremely obese prize-winning pig. And it's often said in the small but vibrant Woodhouse community that if Woodhouse had died earlier, he would have been better known as a writer of musicals or actually films. So people who are really into musicals might know the song Bill from Showboat or they might know the musical Anything Goes and Woodhouse wrote the plot or the book, as you call it to Anything Goes. Woodhouse was, in some ways, the epitome of the early 20th century writer. He embraced the dominant form of the 19th century, the novel, and also mastered the short story. Indeed, he was prolific in both forms. The precise count is somewhat disputed, but we can safely say he wrote at least 70 novels and over 200 short stories in his 70-plus year writing career. But as well as this more traditional literary output, he also explored emerging media, turning his hand to writing for the stage and screen as well. He was supremely versatile, yet his work is always distinctive. And that, Eliza says, has a lot to do with his style. The style we casually refer to now as Woodhouseian or Woodhouse-esque, when we spot echoes of it in other work. T.S. Eliot once said that his love of Woodhouse was just this side of idolatry, and I'll try not to be like T.S. Eliot and be able to give a more objective view. But obviously, I'm a super fan, as well as someone who kind of reads and writes a lot about Woodhouse. But in terms of his style, so there's probably two things that I would say make Woodhouse distinctive. The first is that Woodhouse is a master of prose. And that's not just me saying it's a super fan. That's also, I think, if you spoke to most writers, he's really a writer's writer in lots of ways. He's very ingenious with how he uses prose. So that's literally in terms of the way his words are formed. So a classic Woodhouse 
ism would be a transferred epithet. So he says, like, I balanced a thoughtful lump of sugar on the teaspoon. He really plays with language to convey what he means. But he also came up with his own words, some of which are in the dictionary. So there's my, my favorite word house quoted is in, in Code of the Worcesters. He writes, if not actually disgruntled, he was far from being gruntled. And gruntled since that point has appeared in the dictionary. But he also came up with zing and plonk, lots of onomatopoeia and, and those two are in there. If you know anything about P.G. Woodhouse, you're probably aware of his ability to create characters that read more or less as upper-class buffoons. Bertie Wooster, Bingo Little, Tuppy Glossop and so on. Although that's far from the extent of his range, that milieu is certainly a major part of his creations. I think the other thing that's unique to him is the world he creates, which was pretty consistent from his early days of writing right to the point he died. And it's sort of like a semi-imaginary utopia version of the 1920s. The reason it's a utopia to some extent is because although the First World War is referred to in passing, it's very rarely referred to in the reality of how it would have affected the world. But I always like to say that his world that he creates is more of a fantasy than an ideal. He creates this kind of playground of this 1920s world that then allows him to mess around with language and characters, and it's not a sort of ideal. Woodhouse, like Christie, is often charged with popularising a nostalgic, idealised version of the interwar years that bore little or no resemblance to real life, and then continuing to present it in books for decades as if it hadn't been entirely unrealistic in the first place. Posh people going to country houses to get murdered, and or mess about with pigs and newts, essentially. We know this isn't a fair assessment of Christie's work, and according to Eliza, this is really a very partial and reductive way of viewing the world of Woodhouse, too. In the G's and Worcester books, there are lots of posh young men without jobs. That's not because Woodhouse believed that posh young men shouldn't have jobs. In the books, it's because they're all far too hopeless to be able to hold down any job at all. If you get into Woodhouse, you realise that the 1920s sunlit world he creates is not full of perfect people, but it definitely takes a rose-tinted view of what humanity can be. It's also not accurate to say that Woodhouse only wrote about country houses and the members of the Drones Club. Considering that he was not writing crime fiction, his fiction contains a surprising amount of, well, crime. Nearly every Woodhouse story has either a policeman or some sort of criminal. But to give you an overview of how I think about crime in Woodhouse, there's two types. So the first type I'm going to call the occasional criminals. And if you know Bertie Worcester or any of the characters in his ilk, these are often the occasional criminals. So they might either be doing some drunken hijinks. A classic example would be wading in Trafalgar Square fountain or stealing a policeman's hat as part of a dare. Or through some sort of really complicated, long-winded misunderstanding, they might have to, for good moral reasons, commit some kind of crime. So these spasmodic, delinquents, what what happens to them? Well, they might get a fine. Occasionally they go to prison. Prison is never really portrayed as a particularly scary thing. They'll call it something like 14 days without the option. And actually they're always much more concerned about their relatives or their fiancés or friends finding out than they are about anything else in the opportunistic crime category. Then the second category, these are criminal pros. So you've absolute professionals and some good examples that I love, there's two called Soapy and Dolly Malloy. And to give you a sense of how much Woodhouse, what a soft spot he had for, I say hardened criminals in quotation marks, which you can't see, but I think he called Soapy, who'd been spending some time in Holloway Jail. He said, it looked like she'd been spending the last few weeks at some bracing seashore resort like Skegness. And her husband, Soapy, he said few more loving husbands than he had ever cracked rocks in Sing Sing. He has a real soft spot for these criminals, but the kinds of crimes they do are rarely worse than stealing a necklace, which probably has a huge sum of insurance on it. Turns out to be fake anyway, because it's been pawned off years before. So actually the outcomes of these crimes are really minimal. I think This gives a sense of Woodhouse's joy of humanity rather than a particular approach to crime. Actually, his policemen are often less lovable. These aren't murder mysteries by any stretch of the imagination, but crime is frequently present in Woodhouse's books as a driving force in his comic plots. 
which might go some way to explaining why he was personally such a huge fan of Agatha Christie. After the break, a friendship gets off to a rocky start. When it comes to Agatha Christie and P.G. Woodhouse becoming friends, it was him who made the first move. Woodhouse was encouraged by his publisher to write to Christie as another very popular writer who he admired, but also he was told that she admired him. And he then wrote to a friend and he was absolutely seething because in effect he got three lines back from Christie saying, thank you for writing, I am glad you enjoy my books, as if he'd written as just a fan. And so he felt mortified that he'd sent this long letter about how much he loved her and he'd been completely dismissed. And actually, it seems to have really affected him. Who wouldn't feel a bit belittled by that? He thought he was writing to her as a colleague and she treated him like she would any other stranger who sent a fan letter. Thankfully, after this rocky start, things got better between them. We know that their relationship in the 60s really improved and actually Halloween Party, one of Christie's books, is dedicated to Woodhouse. She says, I'm so glad he told me how much he loved my book. So maybe there'd been a bird in her ear saying he didn't take it the right way. From then on, they did develop the kind of fellowship that Woodhouse had been hoping for all along. They became pretty fast friends. If you get a letter of permission, you can go and read their letters to each other, which are in the British Library. And you can just see, not only do they talk about their mutual experience with critics, Woodhouse obviously says to Christine, you know, I'm so sorry when she gets a bad review and that you're completely right to stick with it and don't listen to these critics. And you see them talk about those things. But also they become such intimate friends that they talk about their health and how they're doing. And you can imagine this is as they're getting older, and what their lives are like. And it's really nice to see this relationship blooming and how much he absolutely loved Christie. Really, for the last 20 years of his life, they were fast, fast friends. Even before he made contact, Woodhouse clearly felt that he and Christie would have a lot in common, just based on his avid reading of her work. We do know from the letters he wrote to his friends what he loved about Christie. And I think I could summarise it as readability. And that might shock people because readability is often an insult. But towards the end of his life, especially, Woodhouse was incredibly well read. I don't think you could find an author who was better read. He wasn't a particularly sociable person, although he did do lots of sociable things. But he was reading everything that came out especially written by friends of his who were certainly writing more on the heavy literature side. But he loved Agatha Christie. He says, in fact, she is the only author who is readable. That is how he describes her. And so I think that's a good hint at what he liked about Christie. I think this is how a lot of us feel about Agatha Christie, that the woman who produced such clever yet comforting books must have been someone worth knowing. And what Woodhouse recognised immediately, which many others have missed over the last century, is the high degree of skill involved in being so utterly readable. Like Eliza says, in some kinds of criticism, the accusation of being easy to read, watch or listen to is wielded as an insult, as if that makes the work in question crude in its simplicity. But as anyone who has read disappointing novels that claim the influence of Christie will know, the deafness with which she conceals the complex forces at work in her books is not easy to achieve. The fact that her books are extremely readable is a function of her great skill, not evidence of the lack of it. And I think the same could be said about Woodhouse, too. One point where Christie and Woodhouse differed, though, is on the question of plot. If you've had the opportunity to look at any of Christie's notes, which have been edited and published by the expert John Curran, you will know that she frequently started a story with an idea for a plot, rearranging the different elements until she had a structure upon which she could build the other elements. Woodhouse, meanwhile, found this to be the hardest part of all, and found it much easier to come up with characters, setting and dialogue. Woodhouse really struggled with plot. So many of his letters are him writing to people saying, do you have any ideas for a plot? And if you're a big Woodhouse fan, you'll know the joy of Woodhouse is the prose and the plot's become interchangeable. I think that he would have really looked at Christie as a master of plot, and that's obviously so much of what she offered her brand of detective novel, was this really methodical consideration of plot, this absolute genius in being able to tie up 
loose ends at the end and think back carefully about plot points. So if I had to guess, I would say that that is also something that Woodhouse didn't believe he had himself and so would have really enjoyed about Christie's books. Although it's easy now to couple Christie and Woodhouse in our minds as two highly successful and beloved 20th century authors, their reputations actually diverged quite starkly in the years following the Second World War. Christie's renown was already assured. By 1940, she had published such hits as The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, Death on the Nile, Murder on the Orient Express, and And Then There Were None. Although there were still great things to come from her, her standing with both readers and the publishing industry was very high, and has only become higher in the years since. Woodhouse, meanwhile, suffered a major knock to his public image as a result of the war. It initially came about because of his living circumstances. When war broke out, he was residing in France, and when the Nazi occupation began there, he was taken to an internment camp for male citizens of enemy countries who were under the age of 60. He spent 48 weeks in these camps. A few months before his 60th birthday, he was released and taken by the Gestapo to Berlin, where his wife was allowed to join him in living at a hotel. During this time, he recorded five humorous talks about life in the internment camp, which were broadcast by the Nazis to American radio listeners. To many in the UK especially, this was seen as an unacceptable act of conspiracy with the Nazi regime, and it has been controversial ever since. Was he really a collaborator and a traitor to his country, or was it just the act of a well-meaning, if foolish, writer out of his depth geopolitically? Here's Eliza to explain more. I think if you're interested, it's definitely worth going to listen to the broadcast that he eventually made, because I think perhaps to a modern listener it'll be surprising how controversial this was, but I'll try to explain why it was so controversial. But in essence, he was convinced by someone he knew who was German, who had been working with the Nazi party, although how much Woodhouse really understood that, I'm not sure. But he was convinced to do these broadcasts where he talked about the things that had happened in the internment camp, which are these slightly comic stories. These were broadcast to the Americans where he had this loving public who was deeply concerned that he died and he was convinced that they needed to be reassured that he wasn't dead. Now, at that moment, it was mission critical in Britain to get America to enter the war. And so the way it was perceived was that although Woodhouse was not saying it was a lack of luxury in the prison, far, far from it, because he wasn't describing it in horrific terms, It was seen as potentially damaging the British case to the Americans to enter the war. The public view of it was obviously this deep sense of hurt and betrayal that he would do anything that could be going against the war effort. And there are really awful letters that he was writing when he just feels completely confused about what happened and how these seemingly very innocent and silly stories of internment could have led to him being, you know, people were calling for him to be killed. Part of the reaction to Woodhouse's broadcasts was informed by the fact that there was an actual Nazi collaborator, the American-born member of the British Union of Fascists, William Joyce, doing propaganda broadcasts from Berlin throughout the war. Joyce, known by the nickname Lord Haw Haw, adopted a jolly aristocratic persona that may well have been knowingly or unknowingly influenced by the characters that Woodhouse himself had created. It's not hard to see how Woodhouse's own broadcasts from Berlin became connected in people's minds with this, even though Woodhouse had nothing whatsoever to do with Lord Haw Haw. In fact, many of his Jeeves and Worcester books from the 1930s lampoon and ridicule fascist characters, especially in the form of Roderick Spode, an absurd Oswald Mosley-esque figure who runs an organisation known as the Brown Shorts. But the damage was done. After the war, Woodhouse went to America and settled there, feeling like he was no longer welcome in Britain, and the situation had literary consequences too. He was treated differently to, say, Agatha Christie. He was very upset because his American publisher told him he wasn't allowed to write about any delicious food in his book. This was after the war, because it would be seen as sort of going against rationing he would read these Christie's where she could write whatever she wanted about all sorts of delicious, you know, lashings of whatever in the various things that were happening in her book. And so he couldn't understand why he was so being looked at. But obviously, given what happened in the war, 
He was just completely under the spotlight. Woodhouse's reputation was eventually partially rehabilitated when the declassification of secret documents showed that he had never been a Nazi collaborator. And at worst, he'd been a bit too naive and trusting during his time in Berlin. In 1975, just a month before he died, he received the ultimate signal that the British establishment considered him to be one of them, when he was given a knighthood. But by that point, he was in his 90s, and he had a whole life in America. It was too late for him to return to the UK and resurrect the status he had once enjoyed there. It's quite a sad story, because I think it was incredibly painful to him that it had been misconstrued in the way it was, and also painful to you know the people in the public who never forgave him. And to this day, there are people who have the idea of him as a Nazi sympathiser. But although Woodhouse did not quite experience the ever-growing celebrity that Christie did in the latter decades of his career, I still think it's fascinating and highly worthwhile to read them alongside each other. Between her murder mysteries and his comic novels, a story emerges about what people really wanted to read in the 20th century. Tightly plotted, cleverly written books, with satisfying endings that weren't above a little silliness now and then. Oh, and the odd murder didn't do any harm, either. This episode of She Done It was hosted by me, Caroline Crampton. You can find a full list of books mentioned at shedoneitshow.com slash Agatha and Plum. I publish transcripts of every episode, including this one. Find them all at shedoneitshow.com slash transcripts. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to stay updated about what else is coming up for the podcast, consider signing up for the She Done It newsletter. We send it every other week, packed full of book recommendations, reading ideas and behind the scenes details about the show. Sign up now at shedoneitshow.com slash newsletter. She Done It is edited by Ewan McAleese. Production assistance from Leandra Griffith. Member support for the She Done It book club from Connor McLaughlin. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.